Welcome again to this webisode. If you recall, I made a parallelism between the quarantine and uh, lockdown of COVID-19 and the monastic life. But a quarantine l lock lockdown of COVID-19 is imposed while the quarantine lockdown or enclosure cloister of the monastic life is freely chosen and undertaken. In this series, I would like to present to you the monastic life from the perspective of the rule of St. Benedict. I came to know Benedict and his rule some five decades ago. He and his rule shaped my life from then on. The 25th verse of Psalm 73. What have I in heaven but you? Apart from you, I want nothing on earth. Capsulates for me the life of seeking God and his kingdom, which Benedict and his rule are leading to. I have shared Benedict and his rule to those who have crossed my life in uh, retreats, recollections, spiritual directions, and uh, I have talked about Benedict and his rule to my students within classrooms. And they all have benefited from such sharings and lectures. So in this series, I would like to share Benedict and his rule to you. My framework in this uh, presentation of the rule of Benedict is uh, the monastic life lived here in Christ of the Desert Monastery. And whatever your state in life and your framework, you can always adapt what I'm going to present in this series as you live your own life. I hope you will find my presentations as powerful adaptogen as you seek God in His kingdom. My purpose here is to help you build a life which seeks God in His kingdom. And my presentations look into the eight aspects of such a life. Namely, uh, spirit life, followed by prayer life, then discipline life, community life, formation life, profession life, and then life based on scripture and life under a rule. So, let's begin. And uh, let's talk about spirit life. What I mean by spirit life is your vocation, your calling from God.
and uh, the Lord invites us. He invites us to a way of life. And we have to listen to the call. In describing the call of God, Benedict quotes two psalms, or rather one psalm and one gospel passage from Psalm 33, verse 12. This is a quotation from Benedict expressing the call of God. Come and listen to me, sons. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So come and listen to me, sons. First, we include also daughters. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. That's from Psalm 33 verse 12 and then from the gospel according to John chapter 12 verse 35 Benedict quotes run while you have the light of life that the darkness of death may not overtake you so with these two uh, verses passages from Psalm 33 and John 12, Benedict expresses God's call to us. But God does not merely voice out his call, his invitation. He does something more. He seeks us in a multitude of people. He seeks us in a multitude of people. Then he calls us again. And this is the quotation of uh, Benedict, still from Psalm 33. Is there anyone here who yearns for life and desires to see good days. So the, the Lord goes to the multitude. And, uh, he seeks you. And he asks, is there anyone here who yearns for life and desires to see good days? That's... Uh, Psalm 33, chapter 12, verse 12, brother. And then going to verse 14 and 15, Benedict continues. If you desire true and eternal life, keep your tongue from vices, from vicious talk, and your lips from all deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Let peace be your quest and aim. So that's how Benedict describes the call. Come and listen to me. Run while you have the light of life. And then God goes out of his way and he seeks us in the multitude. And um, he calls us again. So that's the call of God. And we would call this vocation. Well, it's unfortunate that uh, uh, in modern times when we talk about vocation, we limit that vocation to the priesthood or to the religious life, which is not correct. Now, more specifically, The Lord is calling you, calling us first to glorify God, to glorify God. And then to dwell in the tent of God's kingdom, to avail the blessings of the kingdom and to attain perfect charity. So those are the four specifics of the call of the vocation 
to glorify God, to dwell in the tent of God's kingdom, to avail of the blessings of the kingdom, and to attain perfect charity. Now, this is not exclusively for monks. It's for everybody. But we will see the various contexts of this uh, fourfold uh, specifics of the calling of the Lord in the context of the monastic life. So let's begin with the first, glorifying God. To begin with, we have to ask, what is the glory of God? Well, in the Holy Mass, especially on Sundays and solemnities, the glory to God is always sung. And even on Sundays, especially during the Sundays of uh, uh, the Christmas season and the Easter season, we sing the glory to God. What is really the glory of, of God? The glory of God is intrinsic and extrinsic. The inner life of the Holy Trinity, of the Triune God, and the splendor of His infinite beauty, goodness, truth, wisdom, power, and unity constitute the intrinsic glory of God. How is this? Let's uh, take a look at it from the vantage point of the Holy Trinity. So let's have, we have God. God is a pure spirit, the purest spirit. And God knows himself perfectly. He knows himself perfectly. And eternally, he reproduces a perfect likeness of himself by the intellectual generation of the Word, who is the only begotten Son of the Father. So God generates intellectually, reproduces intellectually a perfect likeness of himself and this perfect likeness of himself is called the word do you remember the first chapter of the gospel according to john in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so you can can you imagine God, a pure spirit? He thinks of himself. And the result of that thinking of himself is a word, mental word, intellectual word. But this word is the perfect likeness of God himself. And so, this word is called by our Catholic faith, Son. When God was thinking of something else other than his own self, when he was thinking of the moon, the stars, the sea, the land, the trees, the birds, etc., that was creation. But when he was thinking of himself, he reproduced a perfect uh, likeness of himself, and that is called the Word of God. And the one who thought is called by our faith Father, and the one generated by the thinking is called Son. So the Word is the Son of God. Now, father and son mutually contemplate each other. 
in this contemplation is generated. In this contemplation is eternally exchanged a current of divine love, which is called the Holy Spirit. So the knowledge of God, of himself, is called the Son, and the love of the Father and the Son is called the Holy Spirit. The knowledge and love that God has for himself in the ineffable mystery and splendor of his infinity constitutes the intrinsic glory of God. So, this is the knowledge of God of himself and the love of God of himself. This constitute the intrinsic glory of God. I hope you begin to understand a little. This is the mystery of the Holy Trinity, which has not been really explained well even in catechism classes. Now to this glory of God, to the knowledge of God of himself, and to the love of God of himself, to this glory, no human being can add anything. We cannot add anything to the knowledge and love of God of himself. What we can do is to contemplate on God's in intrinsic glory. To contemplate on the knowledge of God. And so it's really a, it requires a deep contemplation of the knowledge of God. To contemplate on the love of God. And in this way, we glorify Him. So, we cannot add anything to his knowledge. We cannot add anything to his love. But when we contemplate on the knowledge and love of God of himself, then we are giving him glory. Now, God's uh, beauty, God's truth, God's goodness, God's knowledge and love are reflected in creatures, especially in the human person. So the entire created universe exists in order to manifest the glory of God. From man's point of view, a growing participation in and assimilation to God's attributes through a process called divinization, then God is praised and glorified. So that's how we can glorify God. And uh, this process of we human beings giving glory to God by contemplating on his knowledge and love and on his uh, beauty, truth and goodness and power in creation, this constitutes what we call God's extrinsic glory, extrinsic glory. Is at once something received from God as a sharing in his knowledge and love and something returned to him through adoring contemplation and loving service. I hope you, you understand now what is the glory of God. So next Sunday when you go to Mass and well I don't know if it will be already allowed for you to go to Mass because the churches are still closed. But when the priest celebrates Mass with the few people, 
Sunday we will sing the glory to God in the highest. So the the knowledge of God of Himself, which results in the generation of the Word and the uh, current of love between Father and Son, which uh, results in the generation of the Holy Spirit. To this knowledge and love of God, we cannot add anything. No human being can add anything. What we can do is to contemplate, to spend the uh, our time in contemplating on the knowledge of God and the love of God and uh, contemplating on his uh, on the work of God in creation which is a reflection of his uh, very Godhead now this is what constitutes the extrinsic glory of God so we glorify God through this way now in chapter 57 of the rule of Saint Benedict there is a quotation that in all things God may be glorified ut in omnibus glorificetur Deus in Benedictine houses at the, at the jams of their doors you find the initials all ca in capital letters U I O G D U I O G D is a ut you in omnibus I O glorificator Deus. Now this means two things that in all things God may be glorified. First, that we live a life of contemplation of God's intrinsic glory. We live a life of contemplation of the knowledge of God of himself and the love of God of himself. And second, that we live a life that strives for deeper participation in God's life, whereby God is glorified. Well, there was a seminarian uh, well, he finished his four years of theological education at the Immaculate Conception School of Theology. One time he texted me and uh, he used this uh, saying from Selma that in all things God may be glorified. And I was just wondering if the seminarian knew the implications of this that in all things God may be glorified of St. Benedict in chapter 57 of the rule. But it means two things first. That we live a life of contemplation of God's intrinsic glory, namely contemplation of his uh, knowledge and love. And secondly, that we live a life that strives for deeper participation in God's life. And in this way, we glorify God. It means that we grow in knowledge of God, not just intellectual knowledge of God, taken from books and from conferences and from homilies and from presentations like this, but it's a more in experiential knowledge of God and that we grow in the, in the love of God which is selflessness. So the call, the first implication of the call that Benedict describes in the prologue is to glorify God in all things. So remember that. And this means that we live a life of contemplation of God's intrinsic glory, namely of his inner life, which consists in his knowledge and love. And that we live a life that strives for deeper participation 
in the knowledge and love of God. And that's why it's really important to, for us believers in God to acquire a deepening knowledge of Him, of His mystery 